Please welcome Chris and Thank you, Alex. So I'm going to also start, uh, uh, much like Alex, um, just to talk about the states of AI uh, and what, what does AI mean for cultural producers uh, in particular. Um, why is it important? Um, well, if you haven't been paying attention, this is why it's important. Sorry, another president. Um, uh, very different, not so humble. Um, and uh, and, and as, as many of you probably know, uh, there's a lot of evidence that points to the fact that uh, these two gentlemen have been dramatically reshaping our lives and, and the global order, um, partly because of uh, algorithms and a company called Cambridge Analytica that illegally obtained a bunch of Facebook data and used that data to develop uh, very targeted advertisements, um, as many as 10,000 advertisements in the case of uh, uh, Trump's uh, election advertisements, which were often generated in part uh, through algorithms. So the stakes of this are quite real. Um, Kate Crawford, uh, with uh, uh, both at the MIT Center for Civic Media and with an organization called AI Now, has uh, done this chart, which shows kind of important news events um, detailing how AI and algorithms have been involved in major news stories. It's pretty U.S. Uh, focused. Um, but uh, uh, obviously what Microsoft and Google are doing affects us all. Um, and the crazy thing is that you know, Cambridge Analytica helping to potentially uh, break up the European Union and uh, steal the US elections is only one of many stories, not necessarily the most important one here. Um, and uh, in fact, I think 2017, 2018 are the year where uh, algorithms uh, become part of kind of common parlance. People are talking about them all the time now. Um, uh, in particular, they're um, looking at uh, the way that algorithms are, are being used to make decisions that affect our lives. So this is an example of a typical story where uh, the U.S. Border Patrol, when it um, detains a refugee or a person crossing the border, uh, feeds their personal information into a system uh, and, and the system is supposed to generate for the agents uh, a kind of an expert analysis of whether the person should be detained or not. Um, and in fact, uh, when the system was working well under Obama, um, something like 0.6% of the time, uh, it said that the person should be released, otherwise they should be detained. Uh, and under the new Trump administration, it provides laws so that 0% of the time, the algorithm uh, suggests that they be released. So, um, so I, I think you know these headlines on a 0.6 percent difference um, uh, may be uh, not as you know as important news perhaps. 0.6 percent isn't isn't the most important difference. Um, but on the flip side, you know it also points to the fact that these algorithms actually have been around for a long time. They haven't always involved AI. They haven't always involved computers. Um, uh, and and in fact, many of the kinds of ways of thinking about Risk, uh, uh, you know, people talk about the risk back, or people talk about the risk of society, the way that people talk about probability, the way that people make decisions in infrastructure and in institutions and bureaucracies, are really not new things. Um, and so I, I wanted to take kind of the first half of my lecture and talk about where AI comes from and, 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 and how AI became the thing that it is. Because in fact, there is probably a lot more kind of continuity than there is newness in this, even if the words are new. Um, so AI uh, kind of replicates some of the um, uh, problems that happened uh, long before AI, long before automation. Um, but at the same time, it's also permeating our life in ways that are kind of unexpected and deeply personal. So uh, 2018 was also the year that this happened. <coughs> So this child is trying to play a song that he likes called Digger Digger. So, this is kind of our moment right now. Uh, Alexa, stop as 
moments where we're seeing uh, you know, our lives being permeated by these uh, bizarre kind of mistakes, which actually aren't necessarily mistakes. I mean, the internet was built on porn, why shouldn't it be So, So let me just trace you back through how we got here to some degree. Um, and, and you can, you can choose any, any time, really. Uh, uh, Aristotle uh, once predicted that the only way that a democracy could not have slavery um, is if we developed automatic harps that would play themselves and glasses that would fill themselves. So, so people have been thinking about this in one form or another for a long time. Um, I, I think there's a, a pretty uninterrupted history, though, from uh, around the 1700s when Jacques de Maupassant um, in about 1739, uh, uh, was part of a European movement that had borrowed uh, automata from the Middle East. Um, this was really a Middle Eastern art that had been practiced for about a thousand years. So along with, uh, you know, most of geometry and mathematics, um, Europe uh, kind of borrowed this. Um, and, and what this was was, you know, really the kind of blockbuster special effects film of its time. Uh, they were these things that were considered so uh, Heimlich, so uh, uh, uncanny, that uh, you know, kings would request a, a screening of it, um, they would be shipped around the world, um, uh, there would be lines, uh, hundreds of people long waiting to see these things. Um, this is perhaps the most famous one, the uh, famous Automatic Turk uh, by uh, Wolfgang von Kemplin, uh, first built around 1770, but that continued to tour long after von Kemplin's death, until it was finally consumed by fire. But not before it had played Napoleon Bonaparte um, uh, uh, and, and many other European leaders. Um, so this was this was a, a major, major cultural production in and of itself. Um, uh, it was, of course, a fake. There was a small person inside who was very good at chess. Um, uh, but um, but no one knew that for about 150 years. It was about many times, but. Um, uh, but, but it was uh, a major, major thing. And so, uh, just, you know, simulating uh, the lifelike technology is what Greek sculpture was about, right? I mean, this is, this is nothing uh, unusual. Um, uh, it's been a cultural pastime for a long, long time. Um, and, at the you know, in, at that moment, science was something that was done primarily by rich aristocrats. The word scientist wasn't invented until the 1830s. And it was actually invented as a joke. Uh, uh, the, the Royal Society laughed when someone coined the term. It was called a barbaric American trisyllable. Um, uh, so, so you know, this was uh, it was a cultural pastime by refined people, much like chess. <coughs> um, where where automation starts to get a slightly different valence is uh, around the early 1800s. So this is um, uh, Joseph Marie Jacquard who developed a uh, punch card loom, and uh, those of you uh, as old as me in the audience remember when computers had punch cards. This was developed first in the textile industry, and only much later was it used in uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the kind of mathematical or computational sense. Um, but uh, when I was a kid, these punch cards were what you made computers work with, boxes and boxes of these um, kinds of punch cards. But it was developed first by Jacquard, um, for this kind of uh, weaving process, or, or developed uh, uh, with, with some scale uh, by Jacquard. And if you look at the, for instance, the Wikipedia entry about Jacquard, it points out to the fact that um, uh, Weber was uh, very upset with these looms and was trying very hard to uh, prevent them from uh, becoming uh, widespread. What bizarrely Wikipedia doesn't point to, and I should probably modify it, um, is that Jacquard created this machine specifically after there were some labor, uh, organized labor protests, which affected his uh, profits in his factory, and he started working on it, spent about two and a half, three years developing the loom, specifically to replace labor. So this kind of question, you know, that, that you see in newspapers and magazines all the time, like, will automation, you know, impact labor? Um, it's not a question. It's always been the case. Uh, and and what, what's happened in modernity is this kind of um, dissimulation of a problem where, uh, you know, in fact, automation does create huge problems with labor, just as Uber is creating huge problems with, for instance, the taxi industry. Um, but somehow it's a, a dance that we go through every time as if uh, this eternal, you know, uh, uh, sunshine of the spotless mind as if, as if we haven't been through this a million times, and as if the explicit reason for much automation is simply to reduce costs for um, capital. 
Um, and so this leads then a variety of people to, um, you know, to uh, start thinking of technology in slightly different terms. Um, uh, a lot of the German and, and English Romantic movements were specifically around this kind of problem, uh, uh, kind of an un un unease about the changes that technology is producing in society. And you know, this kind of active fiction of storytelling about this is so important. You know, the playwright uh, Karl Chopek, um, uh, I forget my pronunciation, um, uh, uh, if there's any Slovakians in the room, uh, develops Rossum's Universal Robots, uh, which actually becomes the name of the things that have not yet been invented. Um, so this kind of speculation, uh, the coinage of the word robot, is actually around uh, an uprising of the robots who end up killing their masters. So, this narrative has been around for a long time. It's, it was defined in literature, uh, in art, um, and is simply reproduced later by engineers. The uh, um, early film uh, is filled with examples of this. On the left is the Gollum, on the right, uh, Metropolis. Um, and you know, regardless of whether it's being animated by science or by um, uh, Judaism, uh, these technologies are part of the of the consciousness throughout the. 19th and 20th century um, uh, with these kind of negative valences. Only in Europe, however. Uh, Japan, for instance, has no negative uh, associations with robots um, uh, because they, they didn't have this kind of art historical uh, framework with which to think about it. Um, in the 1940s, of course, driven by a sort of Alan Turing and Polish code breakers, um, uh, thinking machines start becoming uh, something that's a little bit more accessible. This is uh, Claude Shannon, uh, one of the developers of information theory, um, using uh, something that everyone knew in the 1950s, uh, kind of these rat and mouse tests that behavior psychologists were, were popularizing, um, as a way to kind of make an analog to uh, early uh, kind of state and logic machines. Um, so this is a video that he produced. And I want you to just listen to the kind of language that he's using in 1954 or so. Uh, file error beam, and then remember the solution. Another, sorry, let me uh, solve a certain problem by file error beam, and then remember the solution. In other words, you can learn from experience. Like a classical man play, please do kind of a problem and finding a way to a man. His objective is the goal here in the corner. So he basically is saying that this mouse, which is a him, learns by trial and error uh, and pursues its objective. Uh, uh, you know, this mouse is a bar magnet with two wheels. Um, it's like little more than a lump of steel. Uh, it has no objective. It has no ability to learn. So. These analogs were being created by Claude Shannon as a way for technologists to take this really simple, I think it's 26 relays in this um, system, uh, this incredibly simple thing that is primarily used for telephone switching, and to give it these kind of human qualities as a way of, of imagining what could be possible. But you know, the history of AI is really, it's this history of fates, just like the <coughs> machine. Uh, lies, and then perhaps, if you want to be really charitable, metaphors um, uh, through this period, um, and I think it, it, it still to this day. Um, the role of metaphors is so important that Frank Rosenblatt literally looked at everything that people knew about neurons in the early 1950s and created a metaphor for a neuron, a technical metaphor. Um, and so these simulated neurons, uh, called, which he called perceptrons, um, literally just mimicked uh, what scientists knew at the time about how neurons uh, strengthened ties between them and were able to judge things. So in this case, he has a set of input neurons uh, in, in, on one side, he's moving this thing around, and it's able to generate a uh, model of the neurons through an output connection. Um, uh, so fairly simple. Um, he also presented images of uh, men and women to the neural network in an attempt to try to have it classify uh, binary gender um, through an analog system. Um, but AI was only coined around 1956 by a group of scientists, uh, uh, largely at MIT and Carnegie Mellon University, um, who had a very different approach. It was called symbolic logic. And um, so they were trying to use essentially computer code to define things like people and buildings and the notion of inside or the notion of outside. And they were very against this kind of metaphorical work. They thought that 
uh, ultimately, our brain must work through uh, kind of reason, through a rational reason, um, and that this was the correct way to do artificial intelligence. So much so, in fact, that Minsky and Packard published a book um, uh, in the late 1960s called Receptrons, um, sorry, the early 1960s, I think, called Receptrons, which was about Frank Rosenblatt's work um, and how it could never do serious problems that you needed a completely different foundation. Um, uh, this, was, uh, this was so persuasive that he managed to persuade the U.S. Department of Defense, which was sort of the single air system for uh, technology at the time in the United States, um, that only a symbolic logic system could be accountable. Only a symbolic logic system could ultimately make life or death decisions, which of course is what the military wants AIs to do, um, mostly death decisions. Um, but it's, it's hard to explain how against embodiment and, and a metaphor for neurons Minsky was. I was on the same faculty with him for about nine, ten years, um, and uh, he was really the closest to a pure Cartesian that I've ever met. He hated his body, he hated bodies. In, in this one um, faculty meeting, Cynthia Brazil, who uh, was into robots, was talking about robots, and Minsky just slammed on the table and said, God damn it, people shouldn't have bodies. Computers doubly shouldn't have bodies. Why would we build bodies for computers? Um, and this is really uh, part of part of really a, a big subculture in AI, which is around the idea that we will ultimately upload ourselves. And, and it sounds a little bit like a joke, and people think they can't be serious. They are deadly serious about this. Um, these are people who have never taken any pleasure in their bodies, um, and uh, or at least don't don't value that as something that's worth doing. Um, and they're working very, very hard to make sure that no one else can either. Um, interestingly, that form of AI, the form of artificial intelligence that was coined, is largely useless. Um, it, it really produced very little of value. Um, and in the 1980s and 90s, gradually a bunch of insurgent uh, kind of counter AI things started. This is um, uh, another person I was on the faculty with, Sandy Penland, at the Media Lab um, in the 1980s developed uh, what are called eigenfaces which are simply kind of a mathematical representation of what differentiates spaces from each other, and it's built into a massive kind of 3D space, and then you can take a new face and see what it's closest to in this 3D space fairly easily. But this used uh, math and computation. It didn't have any understanding of faces. It didn't have any understanding of a nose or of eyes or shall I compare thee to a summer's day. I mean, there's nothing about this that, that, that had any understanding and so people like Minsky hated it. They called it brute force um, methods. Um, at the same time, some other people started discovering that, in fact, those perceptrons that Minsky had worked so hard to destroy with artificial intelligence um, were actually much more successful if you simply added another layer or two or ten inside between the input and the output. Um, these are what's called deep neural networks or deep learning now. Very, very successful systems. Um, that in fact were, you know, the entire percept, uh, you know, uh, for 30 years no one really worked in them um, because of artificial intelligence. And what's really remarkable about that is that this actually is what now people call artificial intelligence. Uh, Minsky died a year and a half ago, and I'm sure he's, you know, uh, from, from his upload, where he uploaded himself, his ghost is, is um, cursing, cursing this, because in fact this was exactly the opposite of artificial intelligence. Um, but it's now what has become so successful and, and what is AI. But um, I, I know that I'm, I'm you know, using these kind of uh, personal um, traits a little bit, uh, and it might sound like I'm being kind of unprofessional, I'm talking not talking about the math or the theory, but I, I just want to point out that um, engineers are people. Um, uh, I, I know some of you might not agree, um, uh, but, but engineers are people, and they are as much part of culture as any of us. Um, in fact, if we look at anthropologists uh, looking at, at another culture, uh, the, the arrowheads or the huts that people built, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, we would always assume that those are parts of culture, but somehow part of modernity has to split this idea that somehow technology and nature are, you know, addressable completely outside of culture, and then, you know, and then somehow we have this culture side on the other part, but in fact, uh, all the empirical work and science and technology studies points that that's not the case. These, you know, engineering and science are absolutely part of culture, they're absolutely affected by culture. Um, and, and even though it's dissimulated by uh, engineers and some scientists, um, they're just as affected by culture. And this is a great example, this is Rocky Brooks, who developed behavior-based robotics. He swears that, uh, uh, says over and over that 
this isn't science fiction. You know, this has nothing to do with science fiction. But then in other interviews, he says, I love having a science fiction day where I get to experience for real something that heretofore most people have only ever experienced by watching a movie. Um, he's a huge fan of science fiction, as are all these people. Um, and so, so fiction is actually incredibly important to their work. It, it fuels their dreams just as it fuels all of our dreams. Um, and so, so by writing fiction, we can actually influence successive generations of engineers. Um, Rodney Brooks's companies went on to form the Roomba, um, uh, and many of his graduates worked for Boston Dynamics, um, uh, which many of you have seen, and has filled many of our nightmares, um, uh, because of course, we know who will be the people able to buy these technologies, and what they will be used for. Um, uh, people in AI often complain um, that AI is simply the name for whatever hasn't been done yet, um, that, that in fact, uh, AI is um, simply a, a word for uh, whatever problems we haven't solved. And so even though computation has solved many, many problems, people say, oh, well, that's not what's really important. Um, a great example of this is chess. You know, the moment that chess gets mastered by a machine, um, uh, it's no longer really considered that important uh, an aspect of thought. Um, and in fact, the, the popularity of chess has gone down significantly since the mid-1990s. Um, if you remember, Bonaparte wanted to play a chess playing machine, and uh, you know th this was this was what every bourgeois family wanted their children to be good at chess. It was important, uh, you know, for for culture. It was uh, it was part of the newspaper devoted to it. Uh, movies and books focused on chess. Um, it was such an important pastime, especially you know in European tradition. Um, but does anyone remember chess? I mean, it's really the last time I've seen for example someone play chess on the on an airplane was in Africa. It's really not something you see around anymore uh, to anything degree. This is only through 2000. Um, you can see kind of a decline of chess follows almost exactly the moment when uh, computer chess playing games started. Um, I'm pretty sure that the curves look like this at this point. This is from Google and Graham. Um, so AI changes culture. That much is clear. So AI is both affected by culture, but it also then is able to kind of change culture. Let's get to the current. Um, uh, this is the, does anyone know this uh, celebrity? No? Really? How about this guy? Ladies? No one? No? Um, well, in fact, that's because these aren't actually really pe real people. In fact, let me, um, uh, uh, let me just go back for a second. Um, if you look at this guy, um, this handsome gentleman, look at his earlobes. Um, actually, the focus on the projector is not good, but there's like a fair amount of hair on his ear, which no celebrity would ever allow. Um, and then this lobe is just kind of bizarre. It's because these are all faces that are generated through, um, uh, through kind of um, uh, a system where one deep neural network is um, analyzing faces and spitting out possible faces, um, and another uh, neural network is judging those faces and saying whether they seem to be uh, accurate or not based on similar training. So all of these faces are um, kind of uh, synthesized, um, and you can see there's some real monsters out there, um, uh, things that don't look very normal or look in high light, but then there's a similar number which actually look quite glamorous, and um, uh, you know, you can really easily imagine if you were a supermodel or an actor that you must be getting a little bit worried. Um, uh, similarly, you know, I have a five-year-old, and I cannot find a children's movie that's not animated anymore. Um, you know, so, so the role of acting has largely been automated, the role of um, processing, at least in children's film. And of course, that generation will find it less odd if adult films also become synthesized. Um, these are, um, <coughs> you just kind of watch uh, the algorithm crawling through an almost infinite 3D space of possible celebrities. You can tell that when, you know, their forehead is missing because some of them were wearing hats when the photo was taken, the system has no understanding of that. It doesn't matter to the system, it's just generating these kind of bizarre faces. Um, it's happening in other disciplines too. Um, uh, this is music, so I'm going to play you three pieces of classical music that have been analyzed by um, a company called DeepMind that is part of Google. Um, so listen to these three pieces of, five, sorry, five pieces of classical music, and then I'll show you what the computer system does with them. Okay, so.
listen to a lot of classical music, and these are completely uh, generated de novo uh, samples of classical music. If they went on for a while, people would probably start to notice. Um, uh, they would start to sound more and more like Eric Satie, kind of drifting and pointless. But, um, but, but, uh, but, but you know, generally, for those brief moments, it's almost impossible to tell that they aren't actually being played by a human. Um, these are images that are generated largely from pictures on the internet of dogs and squirrels. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of similar, but um, they're not actually trying to be very classical. This is for the classicists. This is maybe the one. Um, uh, but um, but so, so there's a lot of synthesis that's possible. Um, uh, and, and I think what's different from AI in the past is that this is now increasingly becoming a business practice and a governmental practice. And uh, so you can always tell because Amazon is now offering um, deep learning uh, essentially computers in the cloud that you can rent. You can, if you have a problem to solve, you can rent 10,000 of these computers within a few minutes, um, run your problem, and then get the results back. Um, and I think this is really the critical thing, and I think the next speakers are going to be talking about this mostly, um, is that the problem with AI isn't the algorithm, the problem with the AI isn't the math, it's not uh, its uncanny pro process. The problem with AI is, is a problem that we're all very familiar with. It's a problem of power and who gets to use it, who has access to it, what they're using it for, um, and how it affects our lives through these institutions. Um, and so a famous quote is, uh, this is a paraphrase, but you know the problem isn't that one country will develop AI, the problem is that one person could develop an AI that would uh, give them extraordinary power over, in fact, the rest of society. Um, and so we're seeing that um, oh, uh, so in Amazon, Amazon time. Exactly. So this is a recent service that Amazon has around facial recognition. Um, and of course, the first thing that Amazon is doing it is giving this to police forces um, uh, so that they can you know, recognize us on the street through their public surveillance cameras. Um, uh, and, and the ease of it is uh, you know, troubling to people. Um, she ends this uh, news, news quote by saying, uh, this is like 1984. Of course, 1984 was written in 1948, and yet it is still the thing that we use <laughs> to talk about this stuff. Um, you know, and, and if you look at the way that we talk about these technologies, it's almost entirely the lens of fiction, which is very important. It's important that we don't stop creating uh, artwork that, that, that thinks about these things and processes them, because I assure you the engineers are spending very little time on that. Um, and so it's actually important that we do it. On the other hand, um, it's also, we can't just rely on, on artists to do it, and we need to try very hard to create hybrid practices. I'll talk about that at the very end. So AI, all of this training, all of this facial recognition needs data. That's why Amazon is giving it to the police, because the police have the cameras. The police have cameras that are on all the time, with all of us walking through them. And Amazon wants that data so that they can sell this to <coughs> other police systems. Um, uh, and so this is, becomes this kind of loop where AI is giving value to data, but AI needs data to exist. And so this training, et cetera, is happening through big data. And uh, of course, workers in these companies like Amazon uh, are constantly develop, you know, helping the AIs to learn. Um, uh, but um, uh, so Google Maps, for instance, has 20,000 people whose job is to help Google Maps be more accurate. Um, uh, but at the same time, um, users are also helping the system uh, all the time through captures, through uh, choices that they make in online systems. Uh, Amazon uses your purchase history to better understand what to sell you and how to sell to you. And so, in a sense, the users are workers, and it becomes this kind of, are we users, are we workers? Oh, it's the modern platform economy. Um, and, you know, one, one sign of how important this process is, is that Amazon developed a system, uh, uh, you know, over 10 years ago now, I think, um, called the Mechanical Turk. So, a reference to that chess playing robot, um, where basically they figured out how to have people do tiny little things, um, but through an API, through an application program interface. So that you can write a program that asks a group of very low paid workers around the world to solve some kind of problem that computers can't finish yet. Often that means something that helps train deep learning or machine learning processes. Um, and so, you know, it sounds great, you can pick up the job whenever you want, drop it whenever you want, the ultimate kind of liquid labor. But of course, people aren't really making money through it, so they've unionized also through an online platform, which Amazon has not yet bought. Um, uh, there's several of these platforms. Um, 
But we are all working all the time. This is the work of Louis Van Aan and Carnegie Mellon uh, called Human Computation. But it's a, a, a kind of a, a process that is playing out. Uh, platform Capitalism is a great book if you want to follow up some of this to try to understand how you are implicated every day into these systems. Um, but I guess the question is, what can we do about it? I think, unfortunately, much of the split that I've talked about in modernity is between technical and cultural and engineering practice, which tends to focus on efficiency, and ultimately on capital as its client. Um, and these other processes, which include criticality, whether that's you know, the Frankfurt School or art school, um, and, and this division has became very stark in 1968. And I think it's really our job to say, how can we better blend and reintegrate these things so that we aren't developing these technologies almost completely agnostic of ethics. And people like Lana and Kate Crawford are, are doing a lot of interesting analysis in this area. Um, I point to uh, you know, kind of an incipient field which started in the 1980s, uh, Phil Avery, called it critical technical practice, where he basically argues that we have to create multidisciplinary <laughs> hybrids that borrow on the best practices of engineering, but also the best practices of critical theory. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Phil Avery apparently went insane and is now um, in hiding somewhere in the world, no one knows where he is, um, which may well be the best metaphor for this talk that I can say. Um, but, uh, but I would encourage us all to try to become a little bit insane like that. Um, so I'll leave you finally with um, a project I've been working on for a couple of years now around some uh, very cheap disposable uh, protest robots. Um, <laughs> as militaries and, and, and police forces around the world are developing robots to uh, be able to disarm bombs or ultimately kill people autonomously, I think it's very important that we have uh, similar cheap, easy to build systems, uh, kind of robo indignados um, uh, who can um, uh, make sacrifices for us while we're uh, controlling them from cafes, smoking chiton, and um, you know, discussing. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>